Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying uh, together in this series in the, the first uh, letter to the Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study, we were somewhere around the verse, uh, verse 13 of chapter 1. You know, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, verse 17, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So I'm going to spend some time here this morning talking about the wisdom of words, uh, as well as baptism and a couple of other things. I hope everyone is doing well. I think it's important for all of us to realize that words are only terms that have meaning in context. Uh, separate from the context, they don't have any meaning. You know, the popular idea, and I've heard this for about as long as I've been a Christian, is that the first occurrence of a word in the New Testament or or in the Bible is is a good indi indication of what that word means and I've often tried to follow that rule I uh, I guess what I would say about that is that's I, I kind of sort of agree with that and then on on the one hand but then on the other hand I I, I have a little trouble believing that uh, you know here's a book where the author talks about a dog barking and a couple of chapters later he's telling me about some bark on a tree so I go back and I see how it's first used well I, you know where do you get any sense out of that uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have word studies I'm not saying that the first occurrence doesn't, doesn't hold some value But you need to realize that the meaning of the word is conditioned by the context. And folks, I have tried to really emphasize the importance of context. You know, context, context, context. Okay, so, so I don't believe baptism as it's used here in this first chapter of 1 Corinthians is referring to water baptism. You know, many of you know the word baptism means identification. I do not think the word here means baptism in water. I think it's used in the context as identification. Uh, and of course, I don't ask, never ask anyone to agree with me. It's just something I think that you ought to think about. In the 10th chapter, we see that they, they, uh, 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 were all baptized into Moses and in the sea. Well, none of them got wet. You know, they walked through the sea on dry land. So that surely wasn't, surely that wasn't baptism in water. They were identified with Moses when they walked through the sea. Now the context declares that Paul wasn't in the business of identifying converted people. I don't know how many times uh, people have, you know, written me asking me, well, how do I know that I'm redeemed? How do I know that I'm going to heaven? And folks, I can't answer that question for you. God didn't send me to identify people. Uh, Paul wasn't in the business of identifying converted people. Because he said that God didn't send him to baptize. The commission of Paul was not to baptize. And I'm not saying that he wasn't sent to baptize with water. I don't know. But in this context, in this context, he's saying that he was not sent to do any identifying. His purpose, his commission, was to preach the gospel. And now we've got to know what's meant by the gospel. And I suppose I could save you folks a whole lot of time here by just referring back to a number of videos I've done 
on the gospel. Uh, we know from the context that the gospel is the preaching of the cross. Uh, the gospel is not one thing and the preaching of the cross another. We see that mentioned in verses 17 and 18, uh, both. The preaching of the cross, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, He was there 18 months teaching these dear, these precious souls in Christ. And preaching the Word of God, you know, and, and it looks to me like that the Gospel is the Word of God. The good news is the Gospel. That's what the Gospel is, good news. Christ didn't send me to continue baptizing all the time, but to preach, present tense, to preach the Gospel, not with wisdom of words. And when you look at that in the Greek, folks, uh, that word is singular. What it's literally saying is that, uh, you know, most of your translations probably have the word uh, words, but it's singular. My King James Version says, not with wisdom of words. But both of those nouns are singular. Not with word wisdom. Because if I preach the gospel with word wisdom, I make the cross, to, the cross of Christ of no effect. I make the cross of Jesus Christ zero, empty. I nullify it. It becomes void, useless. Whatever translation that you want to make of that word. We're then told that the gospel is the power, the power of God. The cross is the power of God. God... God, folks, is powerless to forgive your sin without the payment of that sin debt. It just couldn't be done. God is powerless to forgive your sin without the cross, the work of the cross. And so this is where we're at in our study. We're going to continue on looking forward. I may jump around a little bit, but I hope that you'll bear with me. My message to you, okay, is not in uh, what you'd call uh, uh, word wisdom. So we see an emphasis on the Word of God, and I think we need to take note of that very seriously. Take note of that. You know, I've, sometimes I'll listen to some minister on the radio, you know, driving down the road in my truck, I'll tell me how burdened he is to make sure that everybody listening to his sermon knows what they have to do to go to heaven. And, you know, he comes up with uh, seven things, the last person I listened to, seven things that a person has to do to go to heaven. Seven. Folks, Billy Graham only had four. You know, and I wonder, you know, does anybody read this book? What do you have to do to go to heaven? Nothing. Nothing. Why isn't that preached? Not with words of wisdom. Or not with, with word wisdom. But, you know, that plural is not there. Not with word wisdom. And word wisdom is contrasted with preaching the cross of Christ. And that is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, in your place, a substitutionary death. Not a death that just made it possible that, that you would, might, if you were so willing, to become uh, a born-again believer in Christ. If you would do something. If he died in your place, you're going to heaven. If he didn't die in your place, folks, you're not going to go to heaven. And somebody says, well, you know, that's horrible. You know, that God's going to let folks go to hell. You know, a whole bunch of them. But dearly beloved, what if God determined to show His wrath against sin? Jesus Christ 
His death on the cross was substitutionary. It's clear in the language. It's, it's so clear that it seems un, really unbelievable to me that people would miss it. I've mentioned this before, Romans chapter 3. I don't, I don't want to really spend a whole lot of more time there this morning, but verse 21 you know, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. And most translations say that it's by faith in Christ and, and so we now go out and we preach, you know, you go to heaven by faith in Christ, not uh, what it says. It's not what it says. It's a genitive. It's Christ's faithfulness. And if you don't believe that, or if you don't want to believe that, tell me, tell me honestly in your Bible study, you know, where is your faith in Christ witnessed by the law and the prophets? If Christ died in your place, you're going to heaven. And the wonderful thing about understanding the grace of God is rejoicing in the fact that we are his children. Dearly beloved, is it unreasonable that a loving heavenly father would provide for his own people? You know, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. You know, why do we, why do you believe John 10, 26? Why do you not believe me? Because you're not my sheep. And, and somehow or, or another in the Arminianism that dominates most churches today, or most of modern Christianity today, you know, we are led to believe that a person is offered the opportunity. It's got to be equal opportunity, right? You know, uh, God's family basically becomes those that decided just to become God's family. A, a person is offered the opportunity of either believing or not believing when Christ clearly says, the reason that you can't believe is because you're not my sheep. In order to believe in Christ, we have to already be his sheep. It's amazing to me how an educated minister could stand up and say, you know, you didn't do anything to be born physically, but you got to do something to be born spiritually. When the scriptures declare that you're born again by the will of God, not by your will, you're born again by the word of God. No verse, no verse anywhere says that you're born again by anything that you do. The scriptures clearly declare that unless you're born again, you cannot believe whether you want to or not. You cannot believe unless you've already been born again by God. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto and upon all them that believe for there's no difference. They're God's children born again by the will of God. There's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I've commented on that phrase a lot. You know, yeah, it's a verse of scripture, but it isn't a sentence. It's only a tiny phrase in a sentence. You know, I've been quoting the sentence, which begins at verse 21. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's, it's the most common verse used by churches on the internet. You know, I, I've got good news for you. You've sinned and you've come short of the glory of God. I mean, what church that professes to be preaching good news wants to put that on the Internet, you know, or in a, in a video sermon? I don't understand that. Because that verse is not saying that everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's saying those that believe, look at the text, those that believe have sinned and come short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Now, please don't get confused. I'm, I'm not saying that, that every single person who's ever... That, that, I'm, not, I'm not saying... Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we all have not sinned 
and felt come short of the glory of God, whether we're one of God's children or whether we're not. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that in the context, folks, in this passage of Scripture, it's not saying everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's saying those that believe have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and they're justified freely by His grace. That's the sentence, okay? If you want to preach the good news, why in the world would you choose a phrase, you know, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, when the next phrase says they're justified freely by His grace? If I'm going to be in the good news business, okay, believe me, I'm, I'm not going to put a period after all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the context, in the context, the only people who have sinned and come short of the glory of God are those who have been justified by His grace without a cause. Not because they accepted, believed, received, or anything else, but because they were His children, born again by the will of God. Cause to be born again. Cause to be born again. Passive voice in 1 Peter. They're justified freely by His grace. They didn't pay anything. They didn't do anything. And when you and I were in that condition of sin, when there was none righteous, no, not one, back up and read Romans 3. When we were in that condition, we were justified freely by His grace. But he goes on, justified freely by his gr grace through the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth as a propitiation for our sin. Dearly beloved, that is why that the cross is the power of God. That's why the preaching of the gospel is the power of God in verse 18, because without the cross, God was powerless. If we preach in word wisdom, we, we try to do it from man's logic. That's, that's what it is. If, I mean, I'm to preach the good news without man's logic, man's wisdom, because that will always lead me away from the truth of the Word of God. The truth is not our wisdom. The truth, folks, is what God said. You know, personally, I'm very serious about my approach to, to this book. I cannot... I cannot bring myself to take it lightly. It's God's Word, and I want to take Him at His Word. What is preaching man's wisdom? Well, if you live a good life. You know, imagine one of our leading evangelists saying on national news when asked, do you think you're going to go to heaven? He says, "I hope. well, I hope I've done enough to go to heaven. What kind of preaching is that? You know, how can that be our leading evangelist? You haven't done anything to go to heaven. Jesus Christ paid it. You know, people stand up and they sing, he paid it all, and then they worry about being able to pay it all. If you're heaven bound, you're God's child, and, and don't criticize God for providing for the redemption of his own and, and not pr providing for those who were not his. He is the one who decreed to show his wrath against sin. And that decree included the substitutionary death of Christ in our place. If I try to preach the cross of Christ with word logic, man's logic, man's wisdom, thinking through faulty logic that the one who tries is the one who wins, the one, you know, you know, the, the one that does the most is the one that gets the shiniest trophy and so on and so forth, then I've made the cross of Christ of no effect. And that reduces Christ's work the cross of Christ to zero. Zero. If your eternal life is the death of Jesus Christ plus your faith, plus your repentance, plus your acceptance, plus your whatever, then he didn't do anything. You're a new creation in Christ because you were born that way by the will of God. You have his seed remaining in you. Those who are born of God can't sin because the seed abides in them. We saw that in 1 John. You don't suppose God had you as a, as a child and then you're a pretty rotten offspring. You're, you're a new creation in Christ. 
It doesn't get any better, and it can't get any worse. There's the conflict of, of Romans chapter 7. The very conflict is there, is there because we've been made a new creation in Christ, because we have a sinless new man. Yet we've retained that old rotten flesh of that old man that God has nothing to do with. That's the disturbing thing about all of the sermons that have good Christians, bad Christians, you know, all kinds of Christians. You got your mediocre Christians. You got your super duper Christians. You know, you get folks, listen. You know, so Christ did a great job for some of you and he, he did a, in a, in a mess for the rest of you. Impossible. Those of you who belong to Christ, you stand before him, holy, unblameable, unreprovable, in his sight. And if you add anything to what he did, you've actually reduced it to nothing because everything's going to depend on the anything. Nothing, nothing depends on Christ. His work's finished. I listen to, to some conservative Baptist minister telling me seven things I got to do to go to heaven so Christ did nothing. Doesn't matter what Christ did. You know, it's foolish for him to spend any time telling me that Christ died for me on the cross and then list seven things that I got to do or I'm going to go to hell. If I go to hell, Christ did nothing for me. If any one of you wind up in hell, Christ did nothing for you. And if I add to the finished work of Christ, I make it nothing. It's all me. Don't tell me that decision determines destiny. When God decided my destiny, when God decided to redeem me, and he did so because I was his child. You know, I could preach on the gospel all day long. It's the gospel is the, is the love of my life, but... We also need to understand that saved does not mean redeemed. And I've gone over this before in various videos. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us, us. That's, that is, we who are redeemed. It's the power of God unto salvation. Salvation. It's the power of God. God has no power to redeem us or save us without the cross. Unto us who are being, that's a present tense, saved. Passive voice. You're not saving yourself. God's doing the saving. But clearly, modern preaching all over the world, especially today, says that you're saved by something that you do. It's a passive voice. Those who believe are being saved, that is, delivered. And why should we try to add man's logic to it and say, you know, you got to accept this. You got to believe this. You have to receive this. If we who are redeemed believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Only redeemed people are saved, folks. I would hope that you understand that you could not believe unless you were already a sheep. And if you're already a sheep, you're heaven bound. What that believing does is relieve you from the burden that comes with unbelief. The only people that you can save, folks, are people who are alive. If, if a house has is, is caught fire and it's burning down, the only people that the firemen are going to save are the people, the only people the firemen are going to pull out are those who are still alive. If they're dead, they're not saved. So the only person biblically who can be saved, that is delivered from sin or anything else, is someone who's already spiritually alive, born again by the will of God. Now, if you believe that, then you're delivered from the burden of sin, from the guilt of sin, the, the fear of death, trying to obey the law, human works, etc., etc. It's a marvelous thing to just to rest in the greatness of our God who loved us, who always loved us, loved us before he ever created the heavens and the earth, who decreed that we were his children that we should sin and die in sin and then showing his love for us would redeem us by dying in our place. That's good news. Why would I want to taint that good news with human works? My job, if 
folks, is not to determine whether you believe or not, not to determine whether or not you're going to heaven or, or not. My responsibility is to proclaim the truth of, the, of this book. If you believe, it's because you're his. If you don't believe, it's because you're not. So I, I don't worry about it. I don't try to decide which which of you folk people out there are going to go to heaven and, and whichever you're not. How many of my Facebook friends are going to go to heaven and how many are not? How many of the people I meet on the street, you know, or during the course of any day, you know, who's going to heaven? How many of my relatives are going to go to heaven? How many are not? Not my job. Not my job. Not your, not your job. I try to proclaim the truth of what this book says. Christ did not send me to identify, says Paul, but to preach good news. The word of God, the cross of Christ, the good news that you're a new creation in Christ by God's design and that you cannot fail. If I preach in word wisdom, you know, try to come up with some logic. You know, people do that all the time. You know, why would God, why would God do this? You know, no God who's a loving God would permit anybody, anybody to go to hell. You know, folks, God is not who you make him out to be. God is not who you might like him to be. He isn't someone that you can fantasize about. God is God. And the only thing that you know about God, the only possible knowledge that you have of God, folks, is in this book. He can only be known by revelation. I know that opens up a can of worms, but that is the position that I've always held, and this is the position I always will hold. And he has, God has vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction. And if you don't like that, then take it up with God. But that's what he says. And he has vessels of mercy, which he foreordained unto glory. He, he holds you in the hollow of his hand. He loves you with an everlasting love. His love has never changed. You know, so, you know, you know, if he loved you 20 years ago, he loves you the same today. Simon, who do you suppose loves me the most? Well, I suppose, and I'm quoting, you know, he who's been forgiven the most. I, I've gotten in trouble in the past for saying this, and I, I guess maybe I shouldn't say it. I don't know. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. Mary Magdalene probably loved Jesus more than Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, I said that in a church many years ago, and I thought, you know, the elders were going to throw me out. Dearly beloved, I praise God for the fact that if I had never known sin, I would have never known the love of God. The grace of God the wonder of God. Had there not been sin in my life, had there not been, how could I have ever known the love of God, the grace of God? In the next video, we're going to be spending some time talking about the world's wisdom. And so I thank you for joining me along with studying along with me in this marvelous epistle. A lot's been said in the first chapter that is just really, really overwhelms us. We're overwhelmed with God's grace right here in the, in the beginning of the, of the entire study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we've had to think about it. May the Holy Spirit take words poorly spoken and seal the message that you want us to receive to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to thank all of you for continuing to be a blessing in my life. Dearly beloved, rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.